Davis. I'm a faculty member in the Brennan School. Welcome to a continuing series from the Zurich Financial Distinguished Visitors Program in Climate Change. I'll introduce our speaker, Dave Tillman. Doesn't look like he needs much of an introduction based on the crowd here today. But before I do that, let me uh, thank and introduce Ben Harper from Zurich Financial Services, who will make a few opening remarks, and then I'll introduce the speaker. Um, we may be able to take some of the overflow, and uh, if you want to have a seat, we're opening up the room next door with a live broadcast. So that's another option for those of you who are getting uncomfortable standing or sitting around the edges here. Um, I'll let you make that choice. Are we okay next door? So if people want to do that, you can relocate next door, but you just will be seeing it through a video feed instead of live. But you ben. still have to turn your cell phones off. <laughs> and turn your cell phones off. Okay, without further ado, Ben Harper. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of Zurich Financial Services, uh, again, I would like to thank the staff here at the Bren School for putting on such a, a fantastic event. Um, and if you look at some of the distinguished visitors to this program that they've had over the year, you notice that there's a diverse, that there's diverse disciplines, um, economists, policymakers, scientists, uh, all bringing their unique perspective to help redefine environmental responsibility. Uh, we at Zurich believe this broad-based view provides the real framework for solving global environmental issues. Uh, while typically science-based, and I suspect many in this room all have a science background, uh, environmental policy is framed around many other socioeconomic issues that require multidisciplinary thinking. Uh, we at Zurich think the Bren, uh, recognize the Bren School for their unique inclusion of these diverse skill sets, uh, which will truly benefit the graduates uh, as the policy makers of tomorrow. Uh, again, we want to thank the school for their continued support through this program, through internships, through research that, that you guys have performed for us. Uh, and on that note, I'm certain you're going to find today's distinguished, distinguished visitor, Dr. Tillman, to be uh, most insightful, and we at Zurich are thankful for his commitment to this program. So thank you, everybody. Again, Ben. Uh, so now the unenviable task of providing a brief introduction to Dave Tillman and his accomplishments. He is the Regents Professor and McKnight Presidential Chair in Ecology at the University of Minnesota. He spent his entire career there since he got his PhD at the University of Michigan. Uh, what to say, he's the most highly cited environmental scientist for the last 20 years, according to ISI. Had a huge impact in environmental science and in ecology looking at things like mechanisms that allow the coexistence of competing species, the relationship between biodiversity and ecosystem services, most recently the nexus between food production, biofuels production, and sustainability, <coughs> biodiversity sustainability. His impact is wide and it's deep across many different areas. Uh, we're running out of, as a society, ways to recognize him for his achievements through awards and so forth. <laughs> But uh, among them, uh, in 1996, the Robert MacArthur Award from the ESA, a uh, member of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Arts and Science, uh, the Japanese International um, Prize for Ecology in 2008, most recently the Heineken Award uh, in Environmental Science in fall 2010. I like what they said with, when they were awarding him the Heineken Prize, which was, Instead of following the lead in popular fields, you have yourself taken the lead in creating new ones. And that's certainly true. It's hard to imagine a more impactful scientist, and it's through an amazing combination of experimentation, through theoretical work, through uh, uh, this attempt to both mix theory and experiments to bring science to policy and management. That's another thing that's very distinctive about his career and particularly important to us here at the Bren School. Uh, I think he's really remarkable in that he's dedicated much of his career to communicating with the public and managers and policy makers to provide a kind of a powerful voice for environmental science in policy making and decision making. Uh, we're lucky to have him in residence here at the Bren School through the middle of February as part of the Distinguished Visitors Program. Without further ado, today he'll talk about food, energy, and the environment. Can we feed the world and save the earth? Dave Tillman. Thank you. Well, 
it is a pleasure to be here. Um, not for the obvious reasons that I'm coming from Minnesota, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which has wonderful charms. Uh, but, um, and the snow is a great charm for the first month or two. <laughs> so, uh, but you have rains which have the very polite behavior of flowing down streets and into drains. <laughs> and snow doesn't do that for us. Uh, but it's also a, 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 a big honor to be here at the Bren School. I've known the Bren School from uh, as it was being founded until now. And I was totally delighted to see their emphasis on solutions to problems uh, develop and now be the core of what they are about. It is exactly what the world needs. Uh, economists and ecologists are often fighting for being the most dismal science. Uh, and uh, we're not dismal when instead of identifying problems, we find solutions to them. And so I, I really ad I admire that, uh, that theme for the Bren School, and I hope I can live up to that theme in the, in the talk I'm giving today. I want to acknowledge uh, the work that I'm going to show you today has been done by many people with whom I've collaborated. Uh, the, the, the deeper work on um, agriculture, its trends, and forecasting I did uh, with Christian Balzer. Uh, who I tried to convince to stay and be my PhD student in Minnesota, but he's now a PhD student here. Uh, some of these people are wiser than I am. I just don't get it. Uh, and Steve Pulaski is an environmental economist that I've been uh, having the pleasure to work with for the last decade. Uh, Jason Hill uh, is somebody who's deeply interested in uh, bioenergy and, and agriculture, and he started as a postdoc of mine, but he's now a professor, and Joe Fargioni is another one who's worked a lot on these uh, issues, and he's now the, uh, a, uh, a, a, an ecologist, a scientist, if you will, that uh, works for the Nature Conservancy, trying to use his skills that way. Matt Burgess is a new PhD student, and Belinda Befford is my research assistant. All of these people have made major contributions to the, to the uh, work that I'm going to be talking about, and I want to thank them first and foremost. So we are at a time which it, we are increasingly recognizing as a very important time for the Earth, for the people of the Earth, for the ecosystems of the Earth. We're at a time when human impacts are expanding very rapidly, somewhat because of increased population, 40% more people uh, by about the middle of the century, but specifically because of greatly increasing uh, wealth around the world. Per capita wealth, median wealth, uh, buying power in nations around the world is increasing rapidly. And it, it should be, on average for the whole world, about 140% higher by about 2050. So that plus 40% more people mean we'll be uh, having many more demands on, uh, uh, for the things which humans require. And two of the big things human require, humans require, two of the big things upon which our society is based are food and energy. So I'm interested in how we might be able to determine how much food and energy really will be needed. What are the factors driving that? Uh, what might be the impacts if we pursue uh, the food and energy ac according to our current uh, methods and trajectories? Uh, and which of the more harmful of those impacts we might be able to ameliorate if we can uh, change either our desire for food or energy in some way, uh, or change how uh, we provide that and meet those needs. Um, and so I guess my goal today is to show you where we are, where we're going, what some of the impacts of that might be, and then some solutions that can uh, help us achieve what I think we all want to achieve. I think we can have a better life for everyone on the world, not just the richest people, but everyone on the world, 50 and 100 years from now. A life where we have a climate we can live in, where we have ecosystems that have been maintained that, that preserve the, the natural capital of the world, all of the species of the world, and that still provide us with the food and the energy that we need to lead good lives and to develop as people and so on. And so I think we have a chance in the next 50 years to change the path along which we have been developing into a path that can really give us uh, and all future generations a much better life uh, than any of us have right now, and that we would give if we didn't take some time to think about where we are, where we're going, what it means, and how we might solve some of the problems we would otherwise create. So I'm, I'll show you a few things that you've probably seen in one form or another. So here's global energy consumption. Uh, this is in quadrillion BTUs. I know it sounds like a made-up number, a quadrillion. 
I think I said it when I was five years old. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, but it's a real number, and uh, you can look at what's happening. Global, this is fossil energy consumption. Uh, we're up around 400 quadrillion. We'll be at 645 in, in about uh, 20 years. And uh, we're going to probably be double where we are right now in about 40 years in terms of global energy consumption. Now, global energy consumption for fossil energy has associated with greenhouse gas release, and you've all seen graphs like this. This shows total greenhouse gas release from fossil carbon sources, not from other sources. Uh, the dark line is the sum over all the possible sources so from 1800 to the present time. It's clearly increasing quite rapidly. That's what's driven the increases in CO2 that we have in our atmosphere right now. And the main sources behind this are shown by the lines below. Uh, first was fossil coal that was being burned. Uh, and then with the automobiles coming online in the 1920s, you can see the blue line start to go up. That's fossil petroleum being burned, mainly for automobiles. And that now slightly exceeds coal, although it'll be a race with what's happening in China, you know, India, and Indonesia, and so on, between whether producing electric power from coal is going to make the coal line go up faster than the new cars are going to make the uh, petroleum line go up. Um, and then uh, natural gas has become an increasingly uh, commonly used uh, uh, method to heat buildings for industrial processes and so on. So this is where we're heading. Uh, and clearly, we are going up the greenhouse gas ladder. <clears throat> now, if you want to guess where you're heading, uh, I think this is a graph that can give you a little bit of insight. This shows per capita income of real buying dollars, money adjusted for inflation. In fact, these are 1990 international dollars. Uh, and then uh, each dot is a year for the uh, UN grouping of nations in being least developed nations, developing nations, or the developed nations. And, and then on the y-axis is a per capita carbon dioxide emissions for each of those years. And what you can see is that as income has gone up from 1950 to, the, to 2008, greenhouse gas emissions have shot up. As people have more money, uh, they use it to get fossil energy. So people definitely consider increased energy use to be something which is associated with the quality of their life. When they have the resources, they, pr they procure it and they use it, and this shows the dynamics at which they use it. Well, you can very easily take these relationships and guess where we might be in 50 years, because uh, there are good estimates as to how per capita incomes are growing in nations around the world, what their trajectories are, we know that the poor nations on average have higher rates of growth, the developing nations, than do the developed nations. And from that, if you sort of just take the, the numbers out there from World Bank and apply them to these trends, it, it looks like all else being equal, we're going to re release about 17 gigatons of carbon per year compared to the seven we do right now, 17 by about 2050. That's a pretty big increase. And that clearly is uh, one of the major areas of concern for greenhouse gas uh, change in the environment is, is that release of greenhouse gases. Well, here's a great diagram. I want you all to memorize this. <laughs> uh, and all I can do is try to point out the more interesting features of it. Uh, this shows all greenhouse gases, not just from fossil fuels, but also greenhouse gases that come from livestock, like. Uh, methane and that come from land use and fertilizer like nitrous oxide, which turn out to be incredibly potent greenhouse gases, 25 and 300 times more potent in how much they can warm the earth than is carbon dioxide. But it sort of lets you see what are the big things that people do that use energy. Transportation, 13.5% of our energy uh, is coming from transportation. 13.5% of our greenhouse gases, if you will, is, coming, uh, for, uh, is, is because of transportation. Electric power is a big one. Basically, 25% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from our need for electric power. Uh, industrial use uh, is about 15% of greenhouse gases in total. The surprisingly largest one is agriculture. Land being cleared around the world to grow crops, which is the big green bar here. This little bar coming down here is fossil energy that is burned uh, on farms to plow fields and so on, or to transport crops or to transport food, it's 1.4%. Uh, and then the greenhouse gas emissions from agricultural uh, fertilizer and livestock are 13%. So the total 
is about a third, 32 point something percent of total global greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture. Agriculture is a grossly underappreciated source of greenhouse gases for the world, mainly because so much of the agricultural greenhouse gases come not from carbon dioxide, but from uh, methane and nitrous oxide, which are very potent greenhouse gases. Uh, but when you look, when you think about burning fossil fuels, farmers don't burn that much fossil fuel, even including in, in the whole transport of food around the country and around the world. That's all added in there. The, the big impacts come from clearing land and fertilizer and livestock. But in total, it is a very large and under-examined uh, segment of how humans are increasing greenhouse gases uh, on the Earth. So I want to explore this segment with you, and let you see uh, what is happening uh, through agriculture to greenhouse gases and other things. Now, not only does clearing land release a lot of greenhouse gas, because uh, if you look at a tree that you maybe will cut down in Brazil to clear land, 40% of the dry weight of a tree is the element carbon. And that carbon will quickly become carbon dioxide in the atmosphere once that tree has been cut down. Normally they're cut and burned. Um, so there's a lot of carbon in, in the vegetation. There's a lot of carbon in the soil that, that is released. Uh, but clearing land also gets rid of habitat where species live. And we are now preferentially clearing land, which is where the vast majority of the diversity of life on Earth exists, in savannas and tropics in, uh, in Africa and South America. And so as we clear land uh, and are able to grow more food, we also threaten species with extinction as well as release quite a bit of greenhouse gas. Um, the fertilizers that we apply uh, are not all taken up by the crop. In fact, on average, about half of the fertilizer we apply is not taken up by the crop. But it doesn't disappear. It, it does something, and, and it becomes, for the nitrogen, it becomes nitrate or nitrite that dissolves into groundwater. Uh, nitrite is toxic at high levels in, in well water, and many people who have farms and wells in, in the Midwest where corn is grown cannot drink their own well water because of the high levels of nitrite. It causes something called blue baby syndrome. Nitrite binds with the iron in your hemoglobin, making it no longer be able to carry oxygen. And that's some, a, a problem that uh, we, most of us do not want to experience. Uh, plus, nitrogen and phosphorus uh, affect the growth of other organisms living in, in freshwater uh, and marine ecosystems. And so the runoff of, 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 of fertilizer from farms uh, has uh, big impacts on those ecosystems. And uh, there's a lot of uh, pesticides that are made and are used on croplands that are, are released. Many of these are volatile compounds that dissolve into the air just like water dissolves in the air, and they come out of the air just like water does when it gets cold enough. Now, if you go to beautiful, pristine mountain lakes and go trout fishing, and you imagine you're going to get trout that have, will be the cleanest, purest food you could eat, you're totally backwards in what's happening. The, the toxic snow, it's called, that falls out of the air from pesticides that, that volatilize away from cropland falls because of the, the low temperature which, at which these toxins actually become solid and sink out of the air, they preferentially fall in areas that are colder, higher up on mountains, uh, further north into Canada, and so on. So uh, it's, things are not always quite what you've seen. These are some of the other impacts of agriculture. Uh, and let me say, I, I'm not saying something that's obvious. I want to just say it. Clearly, agriculture is of major central importance to all of our lives. We wouldn't be here without agriculture. The goal to me is not to slam agriculture. It, it is to try to find a better way to meet very real human needs. And, uh, and not only do we have needs to meet right now, but these needs are growing. But so if you look at what's been happening in agriculture during what was called the Green Revolution, during uh, which time uh, we were able to double global food production, um, we had to add 600 times more nitrogen fertilizer than we were applying at the start. Um, we had to apply, um, it's 200% more P, not 20, I'm sorry, I just saw that there. 200% more phosphorus, 80% more water in the form of irrigation. All those things were needed to let us double the, the amount of food grown on the earth. The, uh, here's what happened to pesticides. If you, look, if you go back to 1950s and 60s and so on and ask how much pesticide was being used then, used then versus now, on average, we are up over 900% in, 
in agricultural pesticide use. Some pesticides are very benign. They get decomposed fairly readily by soil microorganisms and they don't harm anything at all. Other pesticides are not so benign and they are spread around uh, the world. It tends to be the herbicides on average are fairly benign, not all of them, uh, but the uh, insecticides and so on are often uh, neurotoxins or fat soluble toxins that could bioaccumulate and cause other problems. But there's been a big price paid also then here in the uh, feeding of more people, which I, assume, I assert is an essential moral and ethical uh, act for society to make sure humans have an adequate supply of food. But there are costs. Another cost is land. To double global food supply required that we clear and turn into agricultural land about 570 million hectares of existing ecosystems around the world. So these are grassland ecosystems. A lot of them are tropical forests or tropical savanna ecosystems. This is what happened during the, the 40 or so years of the Green Revolution. 570 million hectares is about three-fourths the area of the full United States, including Alaska. It's about one and a half times the size of Europe. It's a lot of land that had to be cleared to feed people. So if you look at these lines, I'm talking about what happened in the past, but you imagine there, there's some way these lines are going to continue into the future. That the amount of nitrogen may go up as people demand more food, the amount of, of, of phosphorus use and water use and pesticides and land clearing and so on may also continue to go along these trajectories. And we'll talk about that uh, in, the, in the meantime. What I want to talk about first though is how much food might we need 50 years from now? So food demand did double in the last 40 or so years, and what might food demand be, let's say, in the year 2050? And then once I talk about the demand, I want to talk about how it might be met, how we could grow that food, uh, what are alternative ways to do that that can help us address issues of greenhouse gases, uh, land conversion, habitat destruction, uh, nutrient loading, and so on, and, and ways that we could best need, meet the very real needs of 9 or 10 billion people who are wealthier than they are now for the food they want to have and provide them that quality of life at the same time that we try to maintain an environment of a, of a sufficient quality that it will provide the environmental quality of life that we need to sustain ourselves. So here's how we decided to try to do this. This shows uh, each dot is a year uh, and the different colors are countries that have been grouped because they have very similar per capita incomes. So the uh, G, the yellowy mustard color, which is way down by the corner of the graph there, are the uh, uh, 15 poorest countries in the world. Very low per capita incomes. They're around something like $500 per year per person. Uh, and you go up the, the scale to the richest countries, which are uh, the, the 15 richest countries in group A are the typical ones you think of. Uh, and their per capita income in 1990 dollars is now around 26 or 27 thousand dollars per person. And what this shows is what food these people demand and how it depends upon their income. And what you can see is that we have numbers here. This is in grams of protein per day, uh, around 300 for the richest countries and around 50 for the poorest countries. And if you actually look at the, the dots, the colored dots, those are a series and they're almost exactly in order of year from 1961 to 2007 for each of those groups. As incomes went up, people's diets went up. So the very sharp relationship between per capita income and what people chose to consume and how much they chose to consume. And so you can take a graph like this Combine this with uh, World Bank or other projections of what per capita income is likely to be in different countries uh, in the year 2050, and from that you can project how much food the world might be demanding. Plus you have to add on how many more people there will be at the same time. It's a very straightforward approach to do this. We did it looking at protein. We did it looking at kilocalories. We actually did fits in several different ways uh, to sort of bracket what we thought were all the reasonable ways you could interpret the data as if there was a single uniform trend for the world or a different trend in each economic aggregate. It didn't have much of an effect in, in what actually came out as the prediction. Because you take these trends, then you apply these projected increases in per capita 1990 buying power, and what you see is that the richest countries, the group A countries, have their incomes go up a bit. 
27%. But as you go down the ladder to poorer countries, those are the ones that are growing most quickly. Those are the ones that are having their per capita incomes go up a, a lot more. So the B countries, um, some small European countries, Mexico, things like that, uh, have their incomes going up about 95% over that period of time. The C countries, things like China, Indonesia, Malaysia, are going up 220% over that time period. The Ds are projected to go up 320 and the Es 350. They're starting at an incredibly low base, but they're starting to industrialize, modernize, uh, and their economies are growing very, very rapidly. And as they grow, everything in the past is going to demand more food. Uh, and when you multiply all this out, oh, then here's what's happening. Um, here's what would happen to the demand of food per person uh, in these countries. And uh, they are sort of moving up the curve I showed you. And the per capita food demand is going up 30%, 40%, 100%, depending upon what the country is and what the group is and how much their income has gone up. So you can take these projected of amount of food demanded per person in the year 2050, multiply it by the number of people predicted to be in each of those groups in the year 2050. That's what's shown here. And the blue bars show the added number of people to a population. And we're going to have about 2.5 billion more people on the world by the year 2050. And they're going to be out in the countries, in the sort of C, D, E, e and F countries, uh, the biggest increase there is in the E group, which if I go back, uh, is having, let me see, go back one more, it's having a 350% increase in per capita income projected. So these rapidly growing countries economically are also the rapidly growing countries in population. It's sort of a double whammy in terms of what's going to happen to their demand. But you put all these numbers together and you come up with this. If you look at crop protein, we forecast that between 2006 in 2050, the total global demand for protein produced by nutritious crops is going to go up 110 percent, a little bit more than doubling. Our forecast for uh, caloric demand is 100 percent. I wish it was 98 or 102. It looks like I just rounded it off, but it actually is 100.1 something percent. So there it is. Uh, now, this is our forecast. The UN F Food and Agriculture Organization also makes forecasts, and, and they say they forecast a 70% increase in the value of food, not the amount, but the economic value of food, uh, uh, at, at the year 2050. This is based upon expert opinions, people who guess what each country is going to do based upon their knowledge of it. 70% um, is a huge increase. Everything I'm saying I could show you with 70%. I just personally trust empirical relationships more than the guesses of experts. So I'm, sh I'm showing you our relationships. So how could we do this? Well, there are three basic ways that we can get more food. We can have more land. That's called extensification. We can have the land that we have be farmed in a more intensive manner, which increases the production of food on that. That, that is intensification. And that is associated by adding more phosphorus and nitrogen and pesticides and irrigation and so on. Uh, and lastly, we can have better crops that with the same amount of inputs give us higher yields. And that, those are called the potential yields of these crops by agriculturalists. So we could, have, we could increase the potential yields, we could increase how intensively we farm, or we could have more land, or have some combination of those as a way to double the food supply for the world. Now if you look at agriculture, there's been a lot of debate about uh, intensification versus extensification. There are people who propose one as being better than the other, um, because each of them impacts various aspects of the environment in different ways. So if you look at clearing more land, that releases, that extensification releases a lot of greenhouse gas from the vegetation that was cleared or from the soils. Uh, but um, if the, the fossil fuel use that you have to have to farm that land uh, is actually a form of intensification, and so that's releasing uh, greenhouse gas. Fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer, is critical to high yields, uh, but uh, nitrous oxide is released from the fertilizer. So the more you fertilize, the more intensive your process, the more nitrogen uh, is released and the more greenhouse gas comes from that fertilization. Land clearing also releases nitrous oxide uh, and has that impact. Now methane, another greenhouse gas, uh, 
comes mainly from livestock production and I don't know of any real way to control methane production except to change diets away from the biggest methane emitting animals, which are cattle, toward ones that emit, emit much less methane, like chickens or fish. Uh, but um, I'm not going to deal with the methane part in, in the rest of this study. So what about genetics? What is the chance that we can have improved crop genetics uh, solve the problems I'm talking about? Well, over the last 45 years, we've been able to get 30% uh, more maize and 40% more hybrid rice because of improved genetics and improved agronomic practices, basically getting a new variety and planting it exactly the right distance away from its neighbors. So it maximizes yield uh, 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 versus competitive interactions. But if you look at what happens, there's some really interesting but maybe discouraging reality out there. This is the Green Revolution and what happened to yields of rice, of conventional rice in the Green Revolution. The green line in this graph uh, shows the yield of the first variety introduced at the start of the Green Revolution in 1965. It was called IR8. I guess it was 1966 was released. That was its yield when it was planted then. What is shown down below is its current yield. IR8, the, lo the lower dot down here, I maybe need a pointer, but right there is what the yield it gets now. And um, if you look at the absolute latest things introduced, the ones far over on the, um, uh, to, the side, to my side of the graph, they have yields that at the top one is only 4% better than the yield of the first variety ever introduced. But if you take the varieties that were introduced in 1965 and grow them right now, you get much lower yield than you got in 1965 when it was planted. The same thing for IR26. It had a yield right near the green line when it was introduced, but now its yield is way down. The more recently a crop has been devised, has been developed, the higher its yield is when planted right now. What happens is that with all crops, there's a little uh, warfare game going on between crops and the pests that attack them. The longer that a crop has been in existence, like the first variety of rice, IR8, has been out there since 1965 or 6, and there's been lots of time for a whole variety of pests to become, to evolve in a way that came over the um, protective traits of the wild rice, of that rice variety. And so it is highly susceptible to attack by many, many different organisms, and its yield is quite low. So what has basically been happening from 1965 to the present is that the actual yield of the crop being used is basically being right up there, level along that green line. And, uh, but the, and it took a new variety every couple years to have a variety that was resistant to the newly evolved pests of that region. And then that would lose yield and another variety had to be in, in, uh, uh, created and released and that would grow and lose its yield and so on. So there, there was always this fighting against uh, increased uh, crop pests that would reduce yield that was being done by plant genetics. But the net effect of the plant genetics is they never exceeded in any meaningful way the yield that you were able to have back in 1965. So there has not been any true long-term yield increase, despite all the breeding, for, uh, for uh, traditional rice uh, in, uh, in Asia. It has always, it has just been breeding could, that could just keep up with the pests that were evolving and attacking the rice. Now, here, is, uh, here are rice yields uh, in uh, China, in a variety of provinces in China. This is a neat paper by Ken Kassman. And you can see the yields uh, went up for a while, and now they're all leveling off. So it's not clear that there is a lot of opportunity for long-term sustained increases in crop yields. So I want to now talk with you about four different ways that, that we might be able to address the issue we have of a doubling in global food demand in the next, by, by 2050, and then trying to find a way that can ameliorate its impacts on greenhouse gases, on nitrogen release, on land clearing, uh, and pesticide use, and so on. What I want to first do is describe where we're heading, the business as usual trajectory. This is what we've been doing for the last 45 or 50 years. This is merely extrapolating uh, what has been happening. And what basically has been happening in the last 45 or 50 years is that the richer countries 
have been investing more and more in agriculture, in inputs and technology and so on, and their yields have gone up quite a bit. Uh, the poor countries have had yields that have been stagnant. In fact, the difference in the yields between the poorest and the richest countries is about a factor of 10. The poorest countries are getting about a tenth the food off an acre of land that the richest countries are. So let's just look at what would happen if we keep having agriculture develop as it has in the past. And this shows the percent change from 2006 to 2050 that we predict uh, for this scenario. Now, we predict that crop yield would go up about 25% over this period. It's not going up very much because, in essence, a lot of the new land being cleared is land being cleared in poorer countries, poor countries that don't have the capital, the knowledge, uh, or the tradition of applying nitrogen, phosphorus, irrigation, and pesticides, and so on. So they get very low yields on that land. Uh, so the, the total global yield uh, per hectare does not go up very much during this period. Uh, but it, during this period, the richer, more industrialized nations are still investing more and more in trying to increase their yields, which is what farmers have been doing for 40-some years. So you can look at the bar there. The second bar is fertilizer use. Fertilizer use globally in this scenario goes up 175% over this period of time. And that mainly is a continued practice of more and more fertilizer being used in the richer countries which already have high yields. Uh, to meet demand that is unmet because yield increases are low would require clearing land, and that amount of land being cleared is about 800 million hectares, which is just about the area of the United States. That amount of land being cleared around the world. The carbon dioxide in it would be released and so on. In fact, that just shows up in the final bar, the one with the slanted lines on it, that's greenhouse gas release. That greenhouse gas release comes from all the land clearing, and all the nitrogen that's being applied with some of that nitrogen becoming nitrous oxide, that potent greenhouse gas. So if you will, this is to me a fairly uh, a scary scenario. We're trying to control greenhouse gases by reducing emissions from fossil fuels. But we have agriculture with very little fossil fuel use accounting for about a third of global greenhouse gas emissions. And if we keep doing things in agriculture as, as we've done before, we're going to have 175% increase in the amount of greenhouse gas that, gas that agriculture itself is releasing. So uh, this scenario is what I would hope is unacceptable to the world, but it's what, we're t what we tend to do naturally. Another sort of extreme case, I just put here just for your own interest, is um, what would happen if yields just stayed right where they were and the only way we got more food uh, was by clearing land. This is sort of a straw man case, if you will, uh, this shows you how important any increases in yield are for society, because they show you that if we had to clear land to meet all of our food need, we would increase greenhouse gas release over 400% from what it is right now. It'd be a massive amount of greenhouse gas being released as uh, an area of, oh, I think it's like uh, 1.5 or so billion hectares of land was cleared around the world. I don't see any reason why this would happen. This merely is to show you that any kind of intensification that's going on, even the kind that we're practicing right now in our business as usual trajectory, is a benefit compared to not getting more food off a hectare of land. So what I want to show you now, what I think are two interesting and important ways to solve this problem. So I mentioned the Green Revolution had big increases in yield and they were driven by big increases in inputs. Uh, whenever you add something that makes something grow more quickly, you get the biggest response for the amount you add at low rates, and as you add more and more and more, eventually the growth rate tends to level off. Well, what we have in the world right now, in essence, are some very rich countries applying massive amounts of nitrogen, and phosphorus, and so on, and, uh, and still trying to get higher yields as prices go up, which the prices are definitely doing, by adding even more they're not getting very much more food for another ton of nitrogen that they add. The return is pretty low. We have other countries that are adding almost nothing, where the increase in their production is, is a very a steeper curve. They're getting a lot more food per unit of added nitrogen, phosphorus, and so on in those countries. So what I want to show you is this. So here, here are the countries. Uh, the, the richest countries are the A ones. You can see what their yields are. 
70%, 77% of all the land in the world has yields that are less than half that of the 15 richest countries. There's an incredible amount of underused land that is giving way lower yields than it has the potential to give based upon its soil and climate and so on. And um, if you look at what's happening in some countries around the world, this shows yield versus how much nitrogen they're using. This is a curve I just mentioned to you. Countries show relationships like this. Adding nitrogen increases yields, but the curve tends to uh, be leveling off. This, it becomes less and less steep. There's less gain in terms of food production at higher intensities of using nitrogen. And that's true for China, Costa Rica, Libya, Sri Lanka, Canada, uh, an incredible number of countries uh, around the world. And I'm going to show you what it's like for the 15 richest countries in the world. This is the yield of uh, kilocalories in the upper graph, the yield of protein in the lower graph. Uh, each dot is a, a year for a country, and it's graphed against the rate of end use. And uh, the, the straight line there shows uh, a linear fit to the data, and you'll notice that that grossly overestimates yield. It really misses the real yield at the low rates of, of N addition. What fits better is a curve, something like a square root function, which increases more gradually, a curve. And what that shows you is that there's the steepest increase in yield is occurring at the lowest rates of addition. And once you get out beyond about, oh, 0.12 uh, or so uh, kilograms of N or tons of N per hectare being added, uh, there's just a lot of noise and there's actually no noticeable trend in there. Now, part of the variation among these countries comes because they have different climates. They have different soils. And we actually have all of that, and we include them in a more thorough analysis. I just can't show you a graph with uh, eight axes or so on it. But I pulled out one of them here. This shows the square root of n, which should make that be a straight line if, if it is a square root function, and it does. So the far graph shows the, um, the, uh, the increase in yield with adding, as you increase the square root of the amount of nitrogen added, and that turned a curve into a straight line. And then it, that is what happens once we've already pulled off the effect of uh, climate. It's called axial evapotranspiration. It's a measure of, of temperature and moisture. So when you pull out an analysis, the effect of the different climates the countries have, and ask what is the underlying effect of nitrogen, there's a fairly simple effect here of, uh, of the square root of the rate of nitrogen use on yield. And that square root means you get a big increase at low, at low rates of use, and, a, and you have a lower increase at high rates of use. So we then ask, knowing the climates of all the other countries, knowing their soils, their pH, uh, um, their carbon content, and so on, what would we predict would be the yields other countries could achieve if they had intensification in agriculture like these top 15 countries? In particular, we asked, what would happen if they were only one-third of the way up that curve? If they were going to have inputs and yields like the lowest, the, the lower third, uh, one-third percentile, 33 percentile in, the, in those countries. So we weren't going out to the really high productive countries. We were at the moderate productivity, uh, moderate input end, but for the 15 largest uh, economies of the world. And we use that then. We call this moderate and strategic intensification. And in this strategy, we say that no country uh, that is adding more than 0.12 uh, tons of nitrogen per hectare will ever add any more. So the rich countries that are already adding a lot of, and we'd say, what would happen if they quit adding any more nitrogen, held it at that level, but other countries came up to that level? That eliminates the massive amount of nitrogen being added to richer countries, which gives a very low return. And then, uh, and then maximizes the actual return on N invested in the poor countries, which barely use any N right now. And we did that for two different cases. One where we assumed yield stayed at 2006 levels. The technology never improved anymore. And the other assumed that yields would keep increasing along the trajectories we've seen for the last 40 years. I think reality will be somewhere between these two, but I don't know where, so I'll show the two to you. So, here, the middle of this graph, is this actually a laser? I bet it is. Here we go. There we go. Oh, where is it? There. It, okay. So here is the optimistic case where we have this moderate but strategic intensification of agriculture 
and there are investments in improving yields, this technology improvement. And what you see is yields, instead of going up 25%, global yields are going up 150%. You're putting the nitrogen into the countries which don't have it, which have lots of unused land that can become much more fertile, and it does become much more fertile. And because of that, no new land needs to be cleared. Existing land feeds the whole world. And in fact, some land can be abandoned from agriculture a little bit. It doesn't take that much nitrogen to do this, because instead of trying to compare to what it took in the business as usual case, here the business as usual case, this nitrogen is mainly being applied to rich countries which already have high amounts there. And to get an increase in yield, it takes a massive amount of N to increase yield a noticeable amount. Here, by adding N, here by stopping the added N here, and by adding N at rates only up to the lower third use rate for the richest countries, a lot of yield increase occurs at a moderate, with only a moderate increase in the amount of N, 25 or so percent more N than we currently use right now. Less land than right now. And because less, no land is being cleared, we have a lot less greenhouse gas releases. Right now we're clearing land every year. So those are eliminated, and we actually have a net decrease in the greenhouse gas impact, impact of agriculture. Instead of having greenhouse gas releases from land clearing and high fertilization, there still is an increase from fertilization. We are fertilizing more, but we're having a massive decrease in land clearing compared to right now, and that actually lowers the uh, greenhouse gas release from agriculture uh, to, uh, to the atmosphere every year. So this is, this is the most optimistic case. This is what would happen if we had this moderate but strategic intensification coupled with investment in increasing yields in agricultural crops that kept pace with the yield increases of the last 40 uh, 40 or 45 years. If yields were stagnant, if they didn't increase at all, we'd have this case where yields go up, oh, 80 or so percent. Nitrogen fertilization goes up about 80, 75 or so percent. I can't read it crooked here, so you, have to, you can read it better than I. Um, uh, we, we only need about a third of the amount of land cleared than the business as usual, about 300,000 hectares. Uh, and greenhouse gas only goes up about 20 or so percent. I think reality will be someplace between here and here if, in fact, we work to increase the knowledge needed by farmers in these nations and, and provide them with the capital incentives, the capital they need to buy fertilizer and get going on the process of, of uh, using the land that they have already cleared, land that they own, to increase its yield. So I think there's some massive benefits for greenhouse gases, uh, for land clearing, for the loss of biological diversity, for nitrogen loading and other uh, uh, in, uh, chemical phosphorus loading into waters and the oceans and so on that could come from a strategic uh, wise program of moderate increase in uh, the agricultural intensity in the greatly underperforming nations. Now you can ask, might this happen? What is it? that limits yields in these countries. Why do these countries have such low yields right now? Well, I don't know. But I have 40 to 50 years of data on each of the 95 largest countries in the world, data on what their yields are, what all, the, what, their, what all their inputs are, what each of their crops are, the protein content of the crop, the caloric content of the crop. I have information on about 100 different political variables. Uh, how many people got killed by political violence in the country, um, uh, how long the last person who was in power stayed in power, so the durability of a regime, what kind of regimes these were. Uh, there's something called polity. Uh, uh, Paul Collier, uh, an economist uh, at Oxford, wrote a very interesting book called The Bottom Billion, in which he looked at some of these variables, and I found others in addition to that. Um, and he found that if you try to understand why some nations became richer and some didn't, uh, polity was a, seemingly a big player. He looked at polity by itself. Polity is a measure of how autocratic, that's a low score, or democratic, a high score, a nation is. And the ones that were more democratic, on average, had their incomes increased more than the ones that were less. Well, there is a bit of an effect of polity here, but not very significant. Here, it's uh, significant at the 0.05 level, um, and having a positive effect, like Collier said. Human capital, though, had a really big effect. This is just the number of years the median number of years of education for citizens in a nation. This is the amount of nitrogen they're applying to their land. In both, for both 
uh, protein, uh, uh, protein here and kilocalorie here, the single most important thing is how much nitrogen is added. Civil uh, uh, violence, basically this, uh, uh, major acts of political violence is called, which is sort of warfare within a country, civil warfare. That does uh, somewhat decrease yields in a country. But in total, across all these variables, you could say, looking at the worst civil violence and the, lack, and the total lack of it, how would that affect the total yield of a country? And this low number here and this low number here tell you that this variable has a very small effect. The really big effect comes from how much nitrogen is being used. And nitrogen here also correlates with phosphorus and potassium uh, and water and pesticides. Um, I could have showed each of those also, and they're all very strongly correlated. Basically, this is more intensive agriculture, has a big effect on raising yields in countries around the world. Gini, this is a measure of equitability. What's the difference between the poorest and the richest people in a country? Greater equitability does lead to a, a bit better production of food. But what this says in both cases for uh, protein and calories is that things that are fairly easily controllable, the availability of nitrogen to a farmer and the availability of education uh, to farmers are the main things it takes to increase yields. And they can be increased whether or not a nation has good equitability of incomes, whether or not it's an uh, autocratic or democratic country, and whether or not they're having political strife. The other, those variables matter. They don't matter very much. There's an immense amount that can be gained independent of those variables. So I think, I'm hopeful, that the ideas I'm suggesting to you actually are realistic and could be uh, pursued. I want to give you a little bit of brief good news, bad news here uh, at the end of my talk. The good news is I showed you how much nitrogen is being used on average for the richest countries. Some countries, because of laws, have, have uh, laws that had discouraged farmers from using nitrogen have actually had the rate of nitrogen use decline. Here's Germany. Germany's rate of end use declined by uh, about 30% from 1995 to the present time, from out here to over here. During that time, its yield went from here to there. So Germans, when they were forced by their government to quit adding so much N because of the effects it was having on, on basically water resources in the country, the German farmers were resourceful enough to find ways to increase yield even though they were using less N. It actually isn't very hard. You add the right amount of N for a crop at the right time, and you can uh, achieve what they achieve. It is not just Germany. The same thing happened in Italy and France uh, and a couple other uh, European countries. So there's hope that even less N can be needed to produce crops if it is used more precisely uh, in the field. Now, that was sort of the good news. The bad news is we have something coming in that's competing with food for land, for fertile land, as biofuels. Uh, if you look at ethanol, uh, it's growing at 13% per year as a transportation fuel for the world. Uh, right now, for um, so a five-year doubling time, right now 30% of US corn land is being used to grow corn that goes to make ethanol. And uh, that is about uh, 35 million acres of land. It's enough corn, if it were eaten, to feed uh, an incredible number of people in an incredible number of parts of the world. But instead, it's being fed to uh, SUVs, basically. Now, I couldn't even complain about that, in some sense, if corn ethanol actually had a positive greenhouse gas benefit. I don't have time to show you today, but I'd love to talk to you about it. When you do the full life cycle of corn ethanol, you end up having more carbon dioxide in the air by the time you burn that corn ethanol than you would have if you had burned gasoline. A guy I know who runs a refinery, when he, when he read this paper, that's how I got to know. I, he, I wrote this paper, he read it, called me up. He said, you're the first person who's been able to tell me I'm a, doing a good thing in my life by making gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I just care about reality. I, you know, I didn't know how the uh, results would come out. But frankly, gasoline is better than corn ethanol uh, for the environment. It's, I know you can quote me on that. It doesn't sound believable, but it's really true. Uh, um, biodiesel actually um, has a better cycle, and it actually has environmental benefits to it. But it is becoming a bigger and bigger product. It's growing at 33% a year, which is a very, for the last eight years, a very rapid growth rate. And it's taking a lot of land. So here's the issue we face. 
we're turning food into energy. Um, and in doing so, people still want food. And when they want food, they have to grow food someplace. And what people are doing around the world is clearing new land to make up for the land that isn't being used to grow food anymore. And when you do that, you release greenhouse gases by clearing that land. And those greenhouse gases are large enough. This is called indirect land use. It's a big area of debate in Congress right now. The current law includes it. Uh, many people in the biofuel industry don't want it included because it says their products are not giving a, a greenhouse gas benefit. But uh, I would say from what we know, there's a lot of n uh, noise. We don't know how much indirect land clearing results from the production of, of liquid fuels. There's a lot of variation in the range. But even the smallest estimates make almost any of our current biofuels that are based upon food not be viable in terms of having a greenhouse gas benefit. So if you step back from this, basically the green revolution turned energy in the form of fertilizer and, and other inputs into food. Uh, the biofuel revolution is now turning food into energy. And what is happening is that the price of food is basically becoming pegged to the price of oil. Um, I would assert that if you look at the land and where we're going, fertile land as well as intact ecosystems are two of the ultimate limiting resources for humanity. Fertile land that can feed us, ecosystems that can save all the organisms that we need to be on this earth with us to keep this earth a livable place. Now, food prices have gone up immensely. They spiked in 2008, leading to headlines like these, food inflation, riots spark worries for world leaders. I was called by a NATO uh, a general concerned about security issues in, in Africa, asked uh, what, I could, what advice I could give him on this. But if you look at what's happening around the world, why this is an issue, in the US, we spend 2% of our median income on food. The poorer nations are spending 20%, 30%, 50%, 70% of their income on food. And when the price of these raw food products they buy doubles, as it did in 2008, and now it's doing the same thing. This headline is from, what's the date on here? January 13th of this year. This is what's happening right now. Um, it's happening again. And this puts incredible pressure on poor people who basically eat commodity crops like corn, wheat, and rice as their major source of nutrition. Uh, they're competing against uh, automobiles uh, as well as many other richer people who want to have a lot more meat in their diet, which is another driving force in here. So if you look at the world, we have the bottom couple billion people of the world own a lot of already cleared farmland, farmland that is massively underproducing compared to what it could produce. If we can find ways, and I would think microfinance is a good way to do it as well as education, to help these people bring these lands up to a moderate level of productivity, they could provide about 70% more food than the world has right now. And in doing so, they would avert the pressures that would otherwise lead to perhaps 800 million hectares of land being cleared, uh, which has clearly massive greenhouse gas impacts as well as biological diversity loss impacts. So maybe you've already said this. Um, I think in total, we have a case where my, my talk asks, can we feed the world and save the earth? My answer is we can't save the world, earth unless we do feed the world. If the poorly producing lands of the world continue to be poorly producing, other lands will be cleared, other lands will be farmed. The people with those lands will still not be able to really feed themselves adequately, much less feed many other people, which they could do. And we will have a world that does lose the vast majority of the, of the remaining native intact ecosystems, uh, especially in, in tropical habitats, lose their diversity, have all the impacts of the carbon release and so on from that. If instead we can get the already cleared lands up to a reasonable level of yield, and this is being tried in some, some, some ways in a variety of African countries right now and is quite successful. People are pretty good capitalists. You give them a little loan to buy a bag of fertilizer and a bag of seed and they find they can get four times the value back in their harvest than they had to pay for that. And that kind of four times uh, difference leads them to do more of it the next year and more the next year and so on. So some initial investments, I think, could, could grow and spread. And if it, does, if it spreads at a rapid enough rate, I think we can stop global land clearing for food production in its tracks. And we can have a world which has a much greater equability of food supply, which I think is very important for preventing 
internal strife and warfare in nations and also warfare among nations, uh, as well as I would assert being an important ethical principle that we should try to have a world in which all people have the food it takes for them to live and develop uh, their full capabilities. Thank you. time. We're going a little bit late, but we, we have to have a few questions after that talk. Uh, okay, let me start up here. Yeah. yeah, I was just wondering, I see one thing you had talked about was the, like a stabilization of elevated yields over time, and I was wondering if you've, um, I guess, considered or done any work at all on um, the long-term sustainability of those elevated yields, like once we hit that stable point, you know, is it are crop yields going to stay there, or at some point are, are we going to exhaust the land and start to see a decline? Um, I don't think land exhaustion with proper farming methods ever should be an issue. Um, I mean, my personal concern is, is the, um, the appearance of a new crop pest for which we don't have genetic resistance. You know, we had a, a crop blight that hit the United States corn in the 19, late 1960s, and there were two different companies breeding corn in two different ways. And just by chance alone, one of those ways of breeding corn had in the corn that they were breeding uh, a trait that was, was, was resistant to the corn blight. And there's some neat aerial photos I remember from that time showing corn fields, some of them totally dead, some of them looking beautiful. The difference was who, uh, what seed supplier had provided the seed. Uh, the seed supplier had no idea that they had something in their crop that made it resistant to, a, at that time, unknown disease. It just happened to be there. So I, I mean, it, it's very important that we keep having seed banks and that we keep, uh, as much as possible, some of the native wild lands where these crops evolved so that we can get genes from them uh, to help fight diseases, as well as very important that we use whatever techniques we can, including uh, molecular engineering, to pull in uh, traits that are beneficial for crops from other organisms. Yes. No. Oh, you have, there's a question here too. That's what he was. Okay. You you talked a lot about um, nitrogen, but at the international soils meetings last summer, people were talking a lot about the concept of peak phosphorus, which you can't so easily trade off for energy. Where does that fit into all of these equations? Yeah, so the idea of peak phosphorus like peak oil or peak potassium is that uh, nitrogen is a gas in the atmosphere, 80% of the atmosphere, and by using energy, you can turn it from a very stable compound, N2, into uh, ammonium or nitrate, which is biologically available. So that's just an energetically required process, and when you reverse the process, you make bombs out of nitrogen, right? That's just releasing that energy back and getting N2 back. Uh, so that's sort of indic indicative of how much energy it takes to make nitrogen be biologically available, because when you undo it, it's explosion. Um, so nitrogen is a nice resource that way, because you can get as much as you want as long as you have energy. The trouble with phosphorus and potassium is that uh, they are all across the Earth's surfaces, but at low concentrations. There aren't a lot of good mining sources for them. Uh, and uh, when we add them to crops, they eventually get lost in the soil by erosion, uh, leaching, and so on. They don't leach very quickly through the soil. That's the good news. Uh, I mean, it's thousands of years. But they, they are swept away by erosion. And um, I, don't, uh, I don't know a real solution to that. Crops have to have phosphorus. I don't know how long. I, Josh, what were the estimates of how long it would be before this would be an issue? You know, some of the things I've seen, I haven't watched it closely, are that, you know, we are looking at seeing those kinds of points in the near to foreseeable future, but I'm not an expert on it. So. Yeah, I know that the largest potassium producer uh, was up for sale at a fairly, what, $25 billion full price, and that Mosaic, which is currently owned by um, Cargill, uh, is going on the market now, and it's the second biggest producer of potassium. So I think there are people if you want to feed people, you have to have those inputs. 
and controlling those inputs then could be a major source of profit for someone. So it, it all makes sense to me. And, that, and the, the interest that the, and the very high prices would suggest that the potassium component is uh, something that is also in very limited supply and hard to, you know, when you, you can't make more potassium out of anything. So. Well, my question would be on the I application of the N, of the N, P, and K, uh, having done this for years, you can take new land and you can, as you point out, you can dramatically do everything with ideas. It's just incredible. Nitrogen, however, if you try to do something like continuous corn with nitrogen, you'll find you'll burn the soil out. You just the, the soil just eventually get, get, gives up. The alternative to that is something called building soil. Now, building soil is a slow process because you, you, you can't do this chemically. You've got to do this organically. In these countries that don't have a lot of expertise, uh, bringing a, a chemical fix, I can see where that produces some dramatic results. But how do you deal with the idea of building soil for situations of people, intensity, numbers of farmers, and you're working this kind of rotation around so you can achieve both ends, because if you don't, you'll run out of gas. <laughs> no, I agree. In fact, there's an interesting paper came out about three weeks ago by someone who uh, was uh, helping a, uh, a series of African farmers. But in addition to bringing in N and better corn seed, this person showed them how to do rotations uh, with various legumes uh, and, uh, and had that part of it was spreading throughout the community uh, away from the people he trained to others more quickly than just the adding the end. Because they were seeing, you know, in the United States, you can, you can maintain uh, corn soil fairly well if you have corn soybean rotations. What's happening right now in the United States because of the high price of corn driven by ethanol is that many farmers are going from corn soybean, corn soybean, soybean to continuous corn. And with continuous corn, they are losing fertility. Yields are going down, which is exactly what you're saying. So I, I, I don't want to in any way imply that I was suggesting that we had to have more end inputs, uh, commercial end, uh, to do what we need to do. I don't have data on anything else. I'm trying to look at a global database. The global database has tons of mineral end applied, uh, and phosphorus, et cetera. I can use those numbers and show what I call how fertility enhancement affects yield. There are lots of ways to enhance fertility that aren't just adding mineral into the soil. I think that those are the ways, honestly, that in the long term are much, are, are much more stable and sustainable. So I agree with what you're saying. And I'm glad you gave me a chance to say something I should have said in my, in my seminar. <laughs> sure. Other question? One more question. Um, what assumptions do you make about waste of food and either you know, pre- or post-consumer side of that waste in how much we need for the future? Yeah, food waste is a, is a big issue. I was at a meeting in uh, the Royal Society in London had in last December, and um, a couple of the talks were specifically on that issue. It, and what surprised me is that the waste of food is a, a, about 30% across all the countries of the world. Uh, it's just wasted in different ways. In poor countries, it's wasted because they don't have the right machinery to get a good harvest of the seeds. So a lot of the seed isn't harvested from the field. And then they don't have good ways to store the grain, so a lot of grain goes to um, pests of various kinds. They don't have a good way to transport it, so stuff is lost in transport. In the more developed countries, those kind of things are minimized, but then our food is processed and put in refrigerator shelves and stores, and it gets stale dated and is thrown out or goes into our refrigerators. I love some ad I saw a while ago saying, well, I think I'll buy two pork chops so I can throw one out next week. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, the reality is that's what many of us do, right? So there is waste on both sides. If, and there are many ways to eliminate the waste. Uh, so I would say an approach of eliminating that waste could probably be cut in half from 30% from to 15%. That's a 15% increase in, in the global food supply. That's a really noticeable change. So I think that would be an important thing to work on. The other thing which happens is that the diets we have have different uh, efficiencies. It takes 20 kilograms of plant protein to give us a kilogram of cow protein, of beef. 
It takes about 10 kilograms of plant protein to give us a kilogram of pork, and about three to give us a kilogram of chicken, and about one and a half to give us a kilogram of farm-raised fish. So those differences in efficiencies uh, have uh, an immense effect on how much land and how much inputs are needed uh, to feed people. Now, grass, pork, I'm uh, sorry, beef can be grass-grown, which I think is a wonderful food, and it has minor environmental impacts compared to uh, having it be fed in, in large uh, um, uh, confined animal feeding operations. But I do think that uh, the, if the wastage issue, uh, having diets that are more efficient in terms of, of conversion of grains into food, uh, having diets that are wiser. The numbers I showed there, I didn't have the time to point it out, but we now eat the equivalent of eight to 9,000 calories per person in the United States per day. And we can't really do that, can we? I've never seen somebody who eats 9,000 calories a day, but they would be bigger than me. I always look at this and say, you know, there's probably five hectares of rainforest right here. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but what happens is we don't eat it, but we have other, one, other things eat it for us. We have those grains eaten by chickens and by hogs and by cattle for us. And the net effect is we, our diet needs 9,000 calories per day of crops produced to give us the calories we actually eat. And that ratio is very different from the richest to the poorest people of the world. And I think it also has a big impact on health that goes in, in the same, much the same direction. I think the, the hosts are getting nervous. I should no, probably I stop. <laughs> we can go on for a while. We are getting into the lunch hour, I should mention. So maybe it's time for people to eat. But um, they will be here through the middle of February. Actually, so, until um, um, till the end of February. Till the end of I haven't told you that. You told oh, me, uh, he told me today as a joke, I could have that office forever. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in thanking you.